Thank you again for uh, allowing us to be here with you this morning. I am very thankful that we are able to share with you a little bit of what's going on in Uruguay. We thank you for your your prayers and for your support throughout the years. And uh, we are we try not to make our family too different than the other families in Uruguay. Uh, so we don't usually use the term missionary in our home, like we are missionaries. Uh, our kids don't even consider that, like we're missionaries. We just serve God and we live in this country. And um, so them coming back, coming to the States, uh, I think are getting in more now. But my son, last time we were here, he was like, what are we doing here in the States? And I was like, well, we go, we visit churches and friends that, because of their sacrificial support, we are able to do what we do in Uruguay. Daddy teaches and mommy teaches, and we can help in a local church. And that's because people are very gracious and, and giving, and that's why we are able to do it. So our kids are like getting it while we're here. But uh, we are very thankful that we have an opportunity to be with you and worshiping with you this morning. Uh, that last song... Uh, in our church, we sing it very often, and I'm sure it's the same for you. I see around, look around in the congregation, I see people crying sometimes, and people um, thanking God when they sing because He's the one holding us fast, and He is the one keeping us. And so whatever you're struggling with, uh, the Lord is keeping you and helping you, and other believers in Uruguay, they are going through struggles too, and he is the same God to them. So we are thankful that we share this wonderful God together, we have the same faith. Um, as missionaries, uh, we visit churches, obviously, and we share about what's going on in Uruguay. But one of the goals that we have is also to challenge people in the area of missions to be involved in missions, either encouraging people to pray or to give or to go. The truth is like all, that all of us, we should be involved in the missions work, in missions. Um, we have to do that. Uh, we are we is not an option. If you say, well, I'm not a missionary, so missions is not for me. That's not what the Bible teaches. So God is still calling people to the mission field. So one of the goals that we have is to encourage some of you to actually consider coming to Uruguay. I don't know. I just say it because I know the Lord can work in people's heart. But we do uh, need help. We do need people qualified teacher, teachers that will go and teach our college. We need a lot of help in the area of music as well. So if you're interested, or the Lord is saying, Go help the Espinels for a little while, like uh, their Craig's family uh, son. Is that you that you're going? All right. Um, that's exciting that the Lord is sending young people to go for a while to serve in the mission field. So that is exciting. And maybe the Lord is, can work in your life as well. We are um, going through weird times, right? <laughs> We don't know what's going on really sometimes. We're like, what's happening again? Uh, pastor was praying for this country, and it definitely. Um, uh, look at the news, watch the news, and you're like, well, what am, what's happening? <laughs> and uh, a brother today was greeting people, and he said, well, God is still in control. God is still in the throne, and whatever is happening, he is in control. So we have that comfort that he is in control. But we are talking about missions now, and we are focusing a little bit on this great commission that the Lord gave us to all of us. And that's not our passage, but if you look in Matthew 28, I'm just going to read those verses, what we call the Great Commission, that is still for today, even during COVID times. The Great Commission is still valid, it's still, still for us. So in Matthew 28, verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. 
Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Other way to say is, go therefore, since I have all power, Jesus is saying, I have all power, go therefore and make disciples in all nations. Make disciples. Go and make disciples. How? Two steps, baptizing them and teaching them. So this great commission of making disciples is still valid for you and for me today. This great commission was given by Jesus to his disciples, and it is the greatest mission today. Our full-time job, I always say, is to make disciples, and everything else that we do is just an excuse to be able to make disciples. So whatever, wherever you work, you might be a doctor, a teacher, an architect, whatever you are, whatever, wherever job you have, that's just an excuse you have to reach people people wherever God put you and you will reach people that I won't be able to reach but if you are faithful to the great commission you will be making disciples in those places so how are you fulfilling the great commission today during this COVID-19 time how are you really fulfilling this great commission how are you personally making disciples are you making disciples are you teaching people about Jesus are you involved in the Great Commission? In our church in Uruguay, since the beginning of um, March, we started studying the book of Acts. And Acts is a great book. I love it. I've been learning to love it even more during this time. And it gives us a wonderful picture of what the early church looked like, or what the early church did. And we do think that this time is a trial time the, with the virus going around and everything that's happening around it. And it's difficult, we understand, it has changed our lives. But if we look at the early church, this church was going through a lot of trials and a lot of difficulties, a lot of persecution. So how did the early church serve during their trials? How did they serve? How did they serve? So I want to look at uh, one passage, and we're going to go there in a second, in Acts chapter 4. So Acts chapter 4, verse 18. We're going to start reading there. And if you look at the context, we're not going to read that, but if you look at the context, this chapter 4 is basically talking, speaking about persecution to the church. The, the church is being persecuted. And the church is still serving the Lord during persecution. And even though we don't like it, persecution is actually good. Trials are good. We don't like them, but they are good. Uh, trials produce this attested faith that produces endurance. And according to James 1, James says in verse James 1, 2, he says, My brethren, Count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So your trials produce something good in your life, produce spiritual fruit. And then in verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So even though we don't like trials, trials are good. We learn through trials. Our first prayer many times when we have a problem is what? Lord, take this away. I don't like this. I don't want this in my life. Take it away. Instead of praying, Lord, I need you to use this to change me. And if 2020 came and went by and you haven't changed Something is happening. <laughs> if all this ha that happened in 2020 hasn't changed you at all, hasn't brought you closer to God or know Him better, something's happening. <laughs> Trials produce 
spiritual fruit in our lives. Look at verse 18 of chapter 4. And this is what uh, these two believers, examples to us, Peter and John, they got into trouble for preaching and helping a man, healing a man. So they got into trouble with the authorities and the leaders. They say, "Uh uh-uh, don't do that again. So verse 18, he says, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorify God for what which was done. We're going to see this passage, these few verses, and I just want to give you two main truths this morning for you to take home. This passage shows us a wonderful example of two men that understood their mission. And they took the Great Commission to something to hold and to obey constantly. These two men were committed to their service to God no matter the consequences. So these are the two truths that you and I will need to take home. And the first one is that you must obey God first, not men. You must obey God first, not men. Fear God, not men. And the second one is that you must preach Christ only. Just preach Christ only. Obey God only, preach God only. So let's pray now and ask God to bless our time together. Father, we need your help this morning. We know that you are desiring to work in our lives, to work in our hearts. We all need you. We all need your word this morning and that you will speak to us. Help us, Father, to understand why you have us in this earth now, what's our purpose, what is valuable, what counts, and thank us to help us to uh, constantly be willing to live and die for you like these believers. We pray that you bless our time now. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be doing the work that only he can do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 19 says of chapter 4, it says, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. You must judge if it's right for us to obey you leaders more than what we obey God. You decide. What do you think? And Peter and John knew exactly what could happen to them, the consequences of disobeying the authorities. But they understood that their mission was clear and even more important and bigger than obeying the religious leaders of the time. They were willing to die for the cause. And it's interesting how Peter and John were asked not to speak. Isn't that different than what we have today in our churches? Can you imagine if we all would be Christians that people would have to say, please don't preach, don't witness anymore. Stop it. You're all the time witnessing to people. Stop it, please. Sometimes we have to encourage people, please speak (laughs) about Jesus. These men were asked not to speak anymore and how we need to have this same passion that this man had for the great commission, for the mission. And this is not a political message at all. (laughs) Sometimes we get confused. This is not at all. The example here is clear. What do you do when the authority over you tells you to do something that God God said you're not allowed to do? Or when you, you always obey 
the higher authority. You always obey the higher authority. I am only sharing what the, God, the, the passage in Acts is telling us about these believers and their experience and their trials and how we need to learn from them. They were threatened and their lives were in danger, but the cause was more important than their own lives. They were willing to die. They decided to obey God over obeying men, and that's the same for you and for me. You have to come to that conclusion conclusion in your lives, the cause of the gospel, the mission you receive from Christ is even more important than your own life. It's more important than my life. Make sure you have come to this conclusion that your life only counts living or is worth living when you're living it for Christ. And when you, that, that's clear in your life, I like this phrase that somebody said, Christ doesn't want to make your life easier. That's not his goal. He wants to make your life count. And if you're just concerned about having your life being easier, you have lost the focus. You need to make your life count. Somebody said, get ready to die well for what counts, counts and matters. These people are an example to us on how you and I, we need to be willing to do whatever the Lord put in front of us for the cause of the gospel. I like to put it this way. We are like in a big puzzle. You, are, you and I were a part of this puzzle. You're a piece. And God has this big puzzle called the redemption history. And you are part of that. God put you there for something, for a reason. And God is trying to complete, will complete that puzzle at one point when every piece is in its place. But you are a piece in that puzzle. And God wants to use you personally to advance his kingdom. And I just hope that we all get that in our lives, in our minds, clear that you personally, you need to be doing something about this Great Commission. We like the idea, all, all of us together, let's all do it together as a group. But it's a personal thing, personal. Sometimes I share with, my, with our congregation, I said, if you understand that the Great Commission was given to you personally, when you talk to your neighbor, you will be thinking, how can I share the gospel me? I'm not going to expect, I'm not going to wait for somebody else to come and share the gospel to my neighbor or to my family member. I will do it. I will take that responsibility because I'm this little piece in the, in the puzzle of God, and he has a job for me. So how are you obeying God? How are you obeying God over all things? And how are you obeying God in the Great Commission? Remember, obey God first. Obey God. Fear God, not men. And the second thing, you must preach the message of Christ alone. These two men, they said in verse 20, Acts 4.20, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. The message was to share what they saw with other people. They had seen great things from Christ. A sinless man that showed them the Father and gave himself for the sins of the world. And they saw him die on a cross and three days later resurrect and walk with them and be with them. They shared time with them after he's resurrected. They also heard him teach many things about this life and the next life, the eternal life. They heard him explain the, th the teachings and the prophecies of the Old Testament. This man had seen great things and heard great things so much that that message changed their lives forever. The message was so powerful that it got them excited. Their excitement was evident. 
Look at this man. Look at the book of, the book of Acts. Preaching, counseling, going here, going there. The church gets kicked out of Jerusalem. They are going out, preaching the gospel as they go. Everybody got excited about this message. So when your message is Christ, there is hope for the listening. When your message, during this time or any time, you tell people, you know, the hope for your life right now is not a vaccine. Your hope is Christ. It's not the government. It's Christ, the hope for your life. When your message is Christ, there is hope for the listener. You must share his message of salvation clearly but with excitement. Be excited when you share Christ with others. Share at home with your family, at work, with your extended family, with your neighbors. When you're excited, others will be excited. I don't know if you share sometimes here at church. Some people in church, they share testimonies and they say, I was witnessing to my coworker or I, my neighbor. I got a chance to go and have tea or coffee with my neighbor the other day, and I was sharing the gospel. I don't know if it happens to you, but when you hear that, you're like, huh, uh, I haven't done that in a long time. I haven't gone to see my neighbor and say, hey, how are you doing? Can I help you? Uh, hey, come over. Let's have some coffee. Let's chat. When you hear others getting ex being excited about sharing the gospel, you get excited. So share that with others so people get excited. And when Peter and John came back to where the other believers were in chapter 4, when they came back, what happened? They got excited to see them, but they also got the news, hey, uh, this is not looking good. We are all in trouble now. So if you look at verse 29... When these believers heard the news, in verse 29, it says, And now these are the prayers of the believers while they were in trouble. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. When the authorities came and said, hey, stop talking because we're going to go and we're going to go after you. They pray, God, give us boldness so we can preach the gospel even more and allow us to do signs and miracles so people can see your works. We don't want this to be a secret. We want to share the gospel with others. Give us boldness. So the message of salvation that they preached in Christ was a message that was exciting. The message was of hope. The message was also a message of exclusivity. In these days, the world talks about inclusivity, to be inclusive, to accept every thought. Everybody's ideas count, and your opinion counts and it's true and his opinion is true let's be inclusive and accept everybody and their opinion the gospel is not like that the gospel is very exclusive the salvation is in one person and only in one person christ alone christ said i am the way i am the truth i am the life he didn't say i'm one way Come to me or come to somebody else. That's okay. Just choose. Choose your way of believing. No, I am the way and I am the truth. There's only one truth and I am that truth, Jesus said. And if you want life, I am the life. You need life. You need eternal life. I am that eternal life that you need. The world doesn't like that. <laughs> and we know that. That's why the world hates the message of Christianity. That's why the world goes after Christians more than any other religion. The message is so exclusive that it's shocking to the world. And the message is one of division. It divides families. The message is such, is so powerful, that when one person believes in it, 
his or her life will change radically forever. That's why you have to be radical in your thoughts <laughs> in the way you live and what you do with your life. It changes you. We know that according to 2 Corinthians, Paul is talking to the believers and he's saying, you know what? We have this great message, this great hope, or this great message of salvation and that we have to share with others. But in chapter 4, read it later, Paul is saying as God is really interested in saving souls, his enemy, the devil, is actually trying to hide the message of salvation. And he had put a veil in their eyes so they will not see the light of the gospel. They will not see it and they will not believe it. So as you are doing the Great Commission and going and getting excited about sharing Christ with others, the enemy is working as hard as you are, or even harder sometimes. Because he doesn't want your family member or your neighbor to come to Christ. But as Paul says, as God is the one that brought light at the beginning, he is the one that can bring light into somebody's life. He can remove that veil that the prince of this world has put. So when you're sharing Christ with others, go get excited, share it, but also pray that God would do his work of removing that veil and see it. Sometimes I say before we, um, sometimes we organize an, an evangelistic activity. And I tell the people there, listen, we can have the perfect message. We can memorize all these verses and memorize how to say this. And we sometimes we get too concerned about our technique on how we share Christ. Oh, I shouldn't, I don't know how to share Christ. Oh, maybe I shouldn't say anything. You're just too concerned about that. Just be concerned about asking God to do the work that you cannot even do. And he can be, he can do that work of removing that veil. He can do the work of bringing light into that person's life. Sometimes we get too concerned. You know the, the parable of the, the sower, the man that was throwing seed and going through the fields and throwing seed. Sometimes we too, get too concerned about how to throw the seed. Is my technique okay? Uh, am I throwing it this way? Is it this way that you throw it better? How do I throw it? Just throw it. Amen. Don't worry about how you do it. Just do it. Get better, obviously, but just throw it. Just share the gospel. Share what Christ has done in your life. And ask that God would do the work that you and I cannot do and he can only do. Let me just share with you some ex an example of, of a man, a believer of the early church, and that was Stephen. Look at Acts chapter 7, verse 58. Stephen is dying at this point, moment because of Christ, and he was a witness and a testimony to these religious people, and they decided to kill him. In verse 58 of chapter 7, it says, and cast him out of the city and stone him. And the witness laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Sometimes we wonder why the early church was so powerful. How exciting it would have been to be during that time in that church. Thousands of people getting saved and getting baptized. All the ministry that was going on. How did that happen? I would like to say that obviously the Holy Spirit was working there in each one of their lives. But there were believers like Stephen in, those, in that church that were willing to sacrifice even their own lives for the cause of the gospel, for the sake of the gospel. And they said, I'm just a soldier doing my job. If I lose my life because of the gospel, 
So be it. And glory be to God. And I think that's why the church, that wasn't a perfect church, we know. We, we read about the problems in the early church. But it was a church with this kind of believers willing to go and sacrifice and do whatever it, it took for the sake of the gospel. So this was the early church. These were the Christians of the early church. Let's all be like them. Let's pray that God will help us be like them. And you say, oh, I don't know if I'm that kind of Christian. Let me tell you, you won't be able to do anything on your own. You need God's grace and you need God's help to be willing to go to this point of giving your own life for the gospel. But it's the best life that we could live, living it, even if it means giving our own lives for the sake of the gospel. Let's pray.